proper way of praising him. Mm -hmm. So I'm so thankful for the gift that uh, Karen is willing to share with all of us. So I want to share today about worship. And it's interesting because our <coughs> conversation already this morning has, has been uh, just a, a weaving of different aspects of worship. We've already talked about the garment of praise. Um, we've talked about um, being in the middle of that waiting period and what that looks like. We've, we've talked about praising Him as we wait. So I want to start in Proverbs, and it's chapter 1, verse 7. I want to read it in the Amplified because I like the way it explains it. It says, The reverent fear of the Lord, that is, worshiping Him and regarding Him as truly awesome, <coughs> is the beginning part of knowledge. It's the starting point. But arrogant fools despise skillful and godly wisdom and instruction and self-discipline. So this, this is the foundation of what I want to talk about today. You know, we're all at different places in our walk with the Lord, but we all struggle in our humanness to connect with him, to understand his character, to have those moments of intimacy in his presence. And here it tells us that the very beginning, the starting point, for the knowledge, for understanding the character of God, is worship. And so as I was thinking about this verse, I'm thinking, okay, how does that, how do I walk that out? How do I explain that so that we grab what it is that this verse is trying to say? It's telling us the very starting point, the very first point in the knowledge of God, and understanding Him, is worship. Hmm. So a lot of times when we say worship, we think of uh, music, we think of um, a choir, maybe, or a worship song, or putting on the radio or iTunes on our phone. And we think of that as worship. But the, the word worship means to kiss toward. So it's an intimate term. It's, it's a relationship with God. Worship can be almighty. Mm -hmm. It can be a word. Or worship can be just instrumental music. Or worship can be a view of the mountains, mm -hmm. or for me, by the ocean. Mm -hmm. You know, worship can be many different things. And so what does worship look like for us? And again, Karen, in the sign language, demonstrated another form of worship before the Lord. So there's many ways to worship, but what I want you to get today is the importance of the starting point, that worship is the beginning. Worship is not something we do as we get older or <coughs> as we follow the Lord and, and become more mature. No, worship is the starting point. Mm -hmm. That is the very essence of our relationship with God. So as we begin to start, we want to look at what does that look like? What, what does worship look like for you? And it might be different for each one of us. But we're going to go through some of this because um, we've already seen that there's some, there's some breakthrough that needs to happen today. Mm -hmm. and whether that's online or here in person, there's some breakthrough that needs to happen. And so as we look at the starting point, we look at his presence. I want you to think for just a minute. What brings you into that place of presence with him? I know Erica was saying a few minutes ago that she felt his embrace. She felt the pressure of his embrace as we were in prayer. And so that's, that's a, a point of his presence. That's a, a starting point in worship. So for you, what does that look like? How do you walk into his presence? You know, maybe it is a song that really inspires you. Or maybe it's prayer time. And you just go before him and pour your heart out. Or maybe it's just proclaiming his goodness. Counting your blessings the way he's brought you through. All of these things are, are tools to get us into a place of worship. So the starting point is his presence. Finding that place where you feel his presence. That place of peace. That place of understanding. In Psalm 26, 8, it says, I love your sanctuary, Lord, the place where your glorious presence dwells. It's a sanctuary. And what does that mean? It's a holy place. It's a set-aside place, sanctified place. And whether that's a place in your prayer closet, as we like to say, or whether it's in a church, or whether it's just in your car. You can have a sanctuary in your car. Amen. A place of holiness, a mm -hmm. place where you connect with God. Some, some of us, that's the only place where we're actually alone, you know, when we're in the car driving. Mm -hmm. uh, others of us have kids in the backseat, right? So maybe <laughs> that's not a sanctuary for you right now this season. 
But I remember going through this back when I was in my 20s. And um, we were living in Costa Rica as missionaries and um, had four small children. And we were um, doing Bible school uh, training at that time. And um, I remember one night when uh, we were at home and we had some visiting pastors with us and they were off in a tent revival meeting and I had their children in the home with me. So I think I had six, six kids with me at home. And they had just gone to bed and all of a sudden they, the ground started to shake. Um, it's known for earthquakes in Costa Rica and so we began to, to feel the tremor. And my thought was these visiting kids probably never experienced that because they're from Florida. And so I got up to go check on them. As I'm moving across the room, it intensifies. And it ended up shaking the whole floor. It was hard to walk. The cabinets are flying open. Things are falling off the shelves. I mean, it was a, a, a true earthquake. And where do you go when the earth is shaking underneath you? You know, it's not like a hurricane where you can run and hide, um, you know, get away from the windows, that kind of thing. It, the whole ground, everywhere you go, everywhere you step, is shaking. And it's a tremendous feeling the first time you go through one like that. And uh, there's a long story, I won't tell you all that I went through that night, but obviously God saved us. He's amazing. The earthquake stopped when I went into prayer. And you would think I would rejoice and be like in that place where, wow, God came through. But instead, on that fear bin and that anxiety, and you know, they had aftershocks and all the little tremors that happened every time I would just, you know, grab, grab something and hold on tight, thinking, oh, this is it, this is the big one. And I thought, this is so not godly you know for me to to have this kind of anxiety is just not of god so i thought okay how do i get back to that place of worship how do i get back into his presence mm -hmm. and at that point the only thing i need to do was to get on the floor and just cry out to god mm -hmm. so i went in my room closed the door and i got down on my face and i said god i'm not moving from this place until i feel a connection with you again you've got to take this fear out of me anxiety's got to go. I know it's not of God. So I was looking for that presence again, that place of ultimate peace where I felt connected to him. And I stayed on the floor. It was a commitment. And I didn't know how long it was going to be, but I knew I needed victory. I needed that place of worship. Thankfully, I didn't have to stay too long. Praise God. God came through, and I had, had an incredible breakthrough in that moment. And I got back into that place, the starting point of worship. And that's what we have to do. We have to learn what is our key, what is our commitment level to get to that place of intimacy with Him. It starts in worship. So there's a, there's a, a process, I think, for us to get to that place. The process I went through after the earthquake had to do with searching for him. I had to be committed. I had to get quiet before him. We talked mm -hmm. about the silence this morning. I had to get into that place where I was willing to not be distracted and to find that intimacy with him. I love the Psalms because it's so many stories about the struggles that David had and then the praises that David had. And it's almost like every other chapter is either a struggle or a praise, right? And you find him going through the same kind of things I'm talking about now. So we can really learn from his life. In Psalm 63, it says, Oh God, you are my God. Let me stop right there. Just an acknowledgement of God and who he is, right? It continues, I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. This is so descriptive. And it's poetic, yeah, but it shows the heart of David as he's crying out. He's in that place of desperation. When's the last time you were desperate for God's presence? Mm. When you were so thirsty for him that nothing else mattered? That you searched for him so completely? And when was the last time you were in that place? Or are you in a dry place right now? Are you in a place of rebellion where you really don't want to hear what God's got to say because you're just not in a place where you want to say yes? Mm -hmm. We all get in those places, right? So where are you right now? It's time to, to take inventory with our God. 
we can be in rebellion. We have to do a heart check. And I think that's one of the things that prayer and praise brings us to, is it helps us to get realigned with God when we get into that place. Because sometimes we can be off and we don't even know we're off. You know, we get, we get busy or sidetracked or distracted or in rebellion or whatever, and we don't know that we're out of alignment with God. And this worship takes us back into that place where we get realigned with Him. He jerks the slack out of us, if I can say it that way, so that we get back into that place where we need to be, back to the starting point of our faith in God. And what is it? It's that starting point of His presence. That's what we want. Um, someone mentioned this morning about the book of Job. And, you know, sometimes we don't want to read Job, right? Because it's not filled with warm and fuzzy, happy thoughts. It's, it's a very difficult book to walk through. Uh, Job went through a very difficult time. But we have to read it because there's a victory in that, right? Amen. And it shows us how to walk in that victory, how to get to that place of hope in his presence. And in Job 22, verse 21, he says, give in to God. Again, I'd stop right there. Give in. You know, I think that so much of our problem is there's a struggle between our, our being in control and God being in control. There's a power struggle within us. And we all feel that from time to time. You know, we have times where we're really good and God's in control and we let him. But so many times we want to grab hold of the wheel again. We want to drive. He says, give in to God. Come to terms with him, and everything will turn out just fine. <laughs> that sounds so easy. If we'll just give in, <coughs> then everything's going to work out. That's the simple gospel. Now, I know it's harder to walk out, and all of us could have testimony after testimony of how much we've had to walk this out. It's a constant power struggle that we go through. And it's the spiritual against the flesh. Mm -hmm. That's the battle we're in in this world. I'm reading on in Job 22. Let God tell you what to do. Take his words to heart. Come back to God Almighty and he will rebuild your life. Clean house of everything evil. Relax your grip on your money and abandon your gold-plated luxury. God Almighty will be your treasure. More wealth than you can imagine. Well, there's so much in the scripture, I could break it down and we could talk about every one of those pieces. But for now, I just want to emphasize the key here. The key is come back to God. The key is worship. The key is laying down your agenda and coming into that place in his sanctuary where you are in his holiness and you acknowledge him. That's what we want. That's where we want to be. So I'm going to go to a story that you're all familiar with now and uh, kind of lay this out in a way where we can grab it. And that's the story of Paul and Silas in prison. And we all know this story, right? We've heard it preached many times. We've read it many times. But I just want to remind you, it's in Acts 16, if you want to make a note of that. Go back and read it later. I'm just going to tell the story a little bit. This is when Paul and Silas were put in prison. And uh, you know we've got to, we've got a picture of what this was really like because in context it makes a big difference. They were in the deepest darkest dungeon. They were down in the real smelly part, the part where it never gets cleaned, the part where it's dark, there's no light. They were in the worst of the worst place. Mm -hmm. Not only were they in the dungeon behind bars, but they were chained. And uh, if you do the research, you can tell that they were chained not just at the ankle, like one ankle chain. No. Both ankles and both arms were chained. They were chained to the wall. So basically, they couldn't move. Mm -hmm. There was no getting up and walking around. There was no, you know, no luxury of any kind in this place. So this is the kind of place they find themselves. And it's in that place, with extra guards outside the door, other guards down the way. We don't know how many other people were in the prison, but we know that they were in the darkest, deepest place. My guess is there were probably a lot more people around. So we, it, it tells us that they started praying in the middle of the night. 
What is it about praying in the middle of the night? Have you ever done that? Is any of you in here? And I'm just going to ask you, have you ever prayed in the middle of the night? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Prayed in the middle of the night. There's something different about that in that late hour. It's one thing to pray in the morning. You have a fresh day. Everything's new. You know, you've got a fresh start. Um, your hope is, is renewed every morning. And I love to pray in the morning. I think we all should. But when you pray in the middle of the night, it's usually because you're tormented. Mm -hmm. There's anxiety. Mm -hmm. There's a disruption. You're not able to sleep. Those are the times that we pray in the middle of the night when we get desperate. Mm -hmm. Those are the times when we're hungry and we're searching, right? Well, this is the time that Paul and Silas were in that place. And this is the time when they were praying. Now, I can't imagine what they prayed at that moment. Um, I don't know, I've never been in that situation, but I know in my times of desperation, my prayers get real simple. Mm -hmm. you know? It's in those desperate places where it just becomes, sometimes it's just, oh my God, and that's it. You know, it becomes really simple. It gets back to that intimate point where if God doesn't come through, it's not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. And whether that's for you in your personal situation or a loved one, somebody that you're you're ministering to, uh, you carry that, you know, and that pain is deep. That's that middle of the night pain. Mm -hmm. And that's where Paul and Silas were. They were in a deep, dark place in the middle of the night in anguish and in pain. So it's in those moments that praise breaks out. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? You know, I think about praise and worship as a, a, a joyful, exciting time that I praise and worship him because I'm feeling joy, because I'm excited, because, you know, things are good. And then it's easy to praise him. Mm -hmm. What about praising him, worshiping him in the dungeon, in that dark place, in that desperate place? How can you praise him in those moments? You know, thank you, God, I'm in the dungeon. Thank you, God, I'm chained to the wall. I don't think that's what it meant. I don't think that's what they prayed. I think they were rejoicing in God because they knew God was bigger than their circumstances. Amen. That they knew God had a purpose. Mm -hmm. And he didn't bring them there to leave them there, that this was a pass-through moment. They knew that God had a greater plan in that dungeon. And we know what the story was. It says in, in verse 26, suddenly, I love that word, suddenly. Mm -hmm. Don't you love it when God comes in suddenly? Amen. There's something dramatic about sudden. It says, suddenly, a great earthquake shook. <laughs> An earthquake. The whole ground was shaking, and it shook the foundations of the prison cell. The very foundation was shaking. All at once, every prison door flung open, and the chains of all the prisoners came loose. The power of praise. The power of praise caused the earthquake, caused all the prison doors to be flung open, and every chain to be broken. Every chain. Not just some, not just Paul and Silas' chain. Every chain in the prison. Every person was set free mm -hmm. because of the praises of two people. Amen. The power of praise. Mm. It's an incredible tool that we have, but it's also the starting point. Mm. That time of worship is an attitude. And Paul and Silas were in a place of attitude. They were in a place of connection, relationship with God. Mm -hmm. That they knew their circumstances didn't define them. That it didn't matter how bad things looked. That God was still in control. That even though they didn't understand and didn't have the answers, they didn't know where the journey was going, mm -hmm. they knew God. Amen. And there was a complete trust mm -hmm. and faith in his ability to bring rescue. I think about the, the men in the fire. And what did they say? Even if God doesn't come through and rescue us, mm -hmm. we're, still, we're still going because God is still there. Amen. And God didn't re re rescue them right away, but he was in the fire with them. Mm. You think God was in, in the dungeon mm -hmm. with Paul and Silas? Mm. Yeah. You think mm. they felt his presence in that moment? Yeah. Why? Because they had cultivated worship. They mm. understood relationship. Mm -hmm. 
they knew that intimacy with God. They knew who God was, mm -hmm. and they knew He was able. You know, as many times I talk to people about whether or not what they're planning to do is God. Mm -hmm. Is it really God that I'm supposed to go on that trip? Is it is it really God I'm to take that job? Um, you know, is this really what God is telling me to do? Uh, so many times we question, God, is this really what you're saying? Or am I just thinking? And our people ask me that all the time. How do I know it's really God? The starting point is relationship. Mm -hmm. When you have that worship as a lifestyle, that intimacy as a lifestyle, then you know what the Word of God says. Mm -hmm. I make my plans, but God orders my steps. Mm. Yeah. Every step I take. It doesn't matter if I know where I'm going. Every step I take mm. is ordered of Him. Mm. Why? Because of relationship. Because of worship. Because I know my God. I've cultivated that relationship. And I know Him. Does that mean that I walk through without ever doubting? No, of course not. We're still human. We still have struggles, and we still have a, a, an enemy that we fight that constantly whispers lies to us. Mm. So we battle a lot in this earth, but God is still the same. He still has relationship. He's still never changing. He's faithful. And how do we remember that in the midst of those times? We get back into the starting point of worship. So what does worship look like for you? What you think about that for a minute? What gets you into that place? Do you do you find yourself in a place of dryness where you're you're trying to sit down and read the word, and you're trying to pray, and it's like oh, I'm just not getting anywhere? You know, you start praying, and your mind wanders. Or you pray, and you feel like your prayers don't get any farther than the ceiling. You just feel empty. We all have those moments, right? Those desert experiences. So how do you get yourself back into that place, mm -hmm. out of the desert? How do you get into that place of intimacy? What is it for you that works? Again, I go back to the Psalms, and many times David just starts talking about the goodness of God. He just proclaims God Almighty. He is the shepherd. He's my Lord. He is the God of the universe. He's the one and only. He's my salvation. He's my Lord. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Mm -hmm. Almighty God. And the more you do that, I found that that in itself brings me to that place where my faith lines up again. Yes, He is. That's who God is. He is Almighty God. Mm -hmm. He is faithful. He is everlasting. He never changes. Mm -hmm. We need to remind ourselves of those things. Get back into that place where we bring ourselves in alignment. And when you start that, You'll start to feel his presence again. Mm -hmm. You'll get back to that starting point. Or maybe it's a song. You know, there are certain songs at certain seasons. Have you noticed that? That sometimes you'll be on this one song and you just like, that's the song, and you keep going back to it. Yeah. And then after a while, it's like that song doesn't do it for you anymore, and you have to go to another one. Mm -hmm. And I think that God does that for us. There's a season mm -hmm. for a song that has that anointing on it for us, mm -hmm. and it just speaks to us. And maybe that's the song to go to. Mm -hmm. And it brings you into that place where you're just, the sanctuary is there again. Mm -hmm. What does it take for you? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's pouring out your heart. Mm -hmm. Just crying before him. Making your request known again. I did a message a, a, a while ago about asking. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's that ask and keep on asking. But if God already knows what we're going to pray before we pray it, why do we keep on asking? You know, he doesn't need to hear it again, obviously. He already knows. So why is the asking, asking, asking for mm -hmm. It's for us. Because when we ask again, it ignites our faith. Faith to believe. God, I ask you for the nations. Mm -hmm. It's been my prayer forever. And when I come back to that prayer, it ignites faith in me again. Mm -hmm. It gets me back in alignment in that. So sometimes just praying before him and asking him for those things again. Mm -hmm. Lord, I know I've been here before. I'm here again, asking the same thing again. But he, he doesn't get weary with our asking. Amen. He wants us to bring that to him. Why? Because it works in us. It creates something in us. So prayer can be another point of bringing us back into worship. Mm -hmm. Singing. Counting our blessings. 
What does that do for you? Does that reignite the Spirit of God and the joy to remember how far He's brought you? All the times when He's been there for you, brought you through those difficult times, doesn't that bring you back into His presence? Mm -hmm. So all these are different ways where we can encounter that worship, that deep place of worship with Him. Mm -hmm. So what does it take for you? And I want to ask you a question today. Where are you in this in this scale? We mentioned several things. Are you in a place where you're right there next to God in that intimate place? Are you in a dry season, in a place of the wilderness where you have a hard time making that connect? Are you in rebellion in some way? Sometimes we can get in rebellion and we don't even know it. Where where are you on that scale? Because we all have those times mm -hmm. as we walk. Through. God wants to bring you back today. I feel like this was the word he had for this group because he wanted us to be reminded of the starting point of worship, mm. getting into that place of intimacy. Maybe there's some chains that need to be broken off today. It happens in worship. Amen. There's power in the worship. Yes. So we need to look at what is it, God, that you have for me today? How do I? I want to play a song, Tom. It, it's uh, I worship you. I live to worship you. And I want you just to go into that place. Allow the song to minister to you, and then we're going to go into a time of prayer. Just let this seep deep in your, in your spirit and allow God to take you back into that place of worship. Amen? Amen. 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 